Welcome everybody. This is a short video presented by the Small House Society at resourcesforlife.com. I'm here with Cheryl Martin who has studied the small house movement a little bit and put together a very interesting presentation. And um, Cheryl happened to be down in the Iowa City area. Normally you're in Minnesota area, in Correct. Minneapolis. Um, so we thought, hey, let's get together, do a video, and have the, the PowerPoint slides be interspersed in the video for those watching to uh, show you the details. So um, I'm on slide one, and this is the presentation, Living Small. Um, should we just move to the next slide? And Certainly. Yeah. Okay, so, so slide two here shows the demographics of what's going on in the Twin Cities. Mm. Uh, between 2007 2008, Twin Cities was granted eight permits per thousand residents with Hennepin County, which is the county I live in, mm. with the highest um, number of permits granted by the by the Med Council. Mm. Interesting. Eight permits per thousand people to build residential? To build residential. Okay. So that's meaning that it's a good growth period yeah. during that timeline. I don't have anything current. Nothing was available on the Met Council for this current year. be interesting to compare that to national trends, but it does sound like a healthy, healthy growth. Um, what are we looking at here? Okay, so this slide shows that in the seven county metro, and it, it lists all the counties here in the far corner, Hennepin, Scott, Ramsey, Carver, Dakota, Washington, and Anoka. Um, on average, $273,200 were spent on a single family unit. Now we wow, know that's, pretty that's a lot of money <laughs> yeah. for your traditional homes. Um, and then 137300 for multifamily unit. There was a 1% increase mm. for the single family unit from 2000 to 2008, plus a 6% six increase, 6 increase for multiple units. What this is showing is, you know, the average building cost is very expensive for your traditional home. Yeah. And so a small living or living small, tiny homes has to offer is considerably less. Yeah, because these numbers would be out of reach for most people, especially if maybe uh, my, you don't yeah, qualify for right that now. kind of loan or something, you know? <laughs> yes. Okay. So a traditional housing cost, we found that uh, the cost of buying a traditional home over a 30-year period um, shows all the details, like the purchase price, uh, down payment, principles, interest, uh, taxes and insurance per year, maintenance on the home, a traditional home, major report uh, repairs and improvements. So your total cost is one million seventy three. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't look at that. They, you know, will go to one of these websites and look at homes that are on the market, and uh, you know, this is what your monthly payment would be, and they think, oh wow, I could buy a house for. You know, seven hundred a month or eight hundred a month or something. You know. Payment buying. And and they don't realize though that that's just the payment. Yes. And that's a payment over thirty years. So you're going to pay three hundred thousand dollars for your hundred and fifty dollar, hundred and fifty thousand dollar home, plus all of these other items that you've mentioned that people don't think to add into the taxes, the maintenance, you know, the roof shingles need to be replaced, all of that stuff added up and you save a, a million dollars over what 30 years 30 years right uh, this calculation is from the national median home price and um, also from the federal housing enterprise oversight from yeah. 2007 so I'm sure that has changed from 2007 to 2013 but here is an average that's very interesting and then the next slide um, shows um, housing in Maple Grove, Maple mm. Ponds, Town Home from the Met Council. These are homes that are built that we consider row houses mm -hmm. in most cases. Um, but it shows a sample of what a traditional home may look like. Yeah. And I hate to admit it, and people are not going to like what I'm about to say, but I sort of like that look of planned communities or even amusement parks where all of the little fake houses look the same. I don't know. And I know other people really prefer the idea of having a community where there's some yurts and there's some underground homes and there's you know homes built with stone and others with straw bale or whatever. Um, but I, I do sort of like that 
look. And, and most cities like that look. Mm -hmm. And some people it's like clean variety. And tidy. It's <laughs> clean and tidy. Everybody's uniform, but yeah. you know we are humanistic. Right. We I want know to it's, be creative. It is ultimately not, not a good so thing. Not so much pink, but yeah. or yellow. But yes, we like to be because because you you know put people in these sort of cookie cutter environments that are almost in, industrial or institutional. And it starts to shape our thinking, you know, because we're not cookie cutter people. We're different. Everybody's different. So it does make sense that a home would be an expression of who you are and your creativity, you know. And right. everybody's needs are different too. If somebody needs a grand piano in their home because they're going to practice piano, somebody else paints, you know. So. Well, can you imagine if your home was identical to your neighbor on either side, and yeah. you came home late from working late yeah. or too too long out on the town with friends? Mm -hmm. And since they all look alike, you pull into the wrong house mm -hmm. and you sleep in the wrong bed and yeah. you realize that you're in the wrong home. But everybody buys the same furniture from the same big box store, so you probably wouldn't even notice, you know, you right. and spend the night and you go to work the next day. <laughs> A little out of it from whatever you did out in the town. <laughs> Okay. So here in this slide we're showing tiny housing and the cost of building a tiny house over 30 years is roughly 65% less than your traditional home. Wow, that's amazing. Um, and these, this total is um, significant to a stationary. Mm -hmm. So if we do portable, obviously your initial cost is going to be less. Right. So you're not going to have a foundation to be considerate, concerned mm -hmm. with. Uh, so rebar and cement and you know footings. Yeah would change. Um, you do, however, have trailer maintenance, something that yeah. we don't really consider. And can you imagine tipping your house to one side in order to jack up and and finish, you know, fix the bearings mm -hmm. or repack the bearings or, in, you know. Yeah, that's something that it's really <laughs> interesting. People ask about, you know, why are the homes on wheels? Why are they on these trailers? Is it because people want to travel? Well, that may be part of it. There are people that think, oh, they're going to get a Ford F-150 or some big truck to pull their house around with, um, a lot of it just has to do with housing codes. That If you wanted a tiny house on a foundation, that is, in most communities, illegal. Um, as soon as you lift the same house up two feet in the air and put it on a trailer, then it's perfectly fine, according to the local laws, which have, uh, you know, uh, this, these... I guess different laws associated with what's called temporary housing or RVs or whatever. So sheds, sheds. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a shed doesn't necessarily need a permit in certain cities. Uh -huh. and, and most of what is available on a trailer is one one thirty square foot, maybe three hundred mm -hmm. if you're a professional driver. Yeah, <laughs> and in, in my home, the tiny home that I was in from two thousand three to two thousand nine, uh, it's a, it was a ten by seven. I left it up on jacks. It, it went out a couple of times for an open house event, but otherwise it was just up on jacks on a firm foundation. Um, and the only reason for having it on a trailer really was just that that was the only way I could legally live in a tiny space. If the city said, oh, you can build a small you know, cabin in the backyard, I would have done that. So, uh, sure. and as I say, there are other people who want the wheels for mobility, but that was not my case. Um, this slide shows how tiny housing positioning. It's a mm. um, marketing feature for positioning. How does your brand position to other brands that are in the same field or same industry? And um, we use this in a sales presentation uh, in a class that I took for school. And it shows high price, low price, low mm -hmm. quality, high quality. And in between, you have what is the good mix. You want the center circle as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, here we're I, you know, identifying a low quality, low, low price in that left-hand margin. You have mm -hmm. cardboard boxes, yeah. which would be low quality, low price, because mm -hmm. it's pretty cheap, but yet the quality can sustain wind and rain. And then you have home trailers, which appeal and, and serve the need. However, their quality manufacturing is not as great prior to tiny house industry. And then next is tents and Sears still mm -hmm. makes cataloged um, uh, housing that you can buy yeah. out of the catalog. We have some in the neighborhood where uh, one of our family homes is 
and uh, there's a, see, people have seen these houses in the neighborhood, and they say, "Oh, that's a Sears house," you know. And and they're yeah. the first, so they can't yeah. really necessarily be excluded, but they're on that low price. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you can still today buy a Sears product to build. Yeah. Um, on the high price, they have an RV. You know, mm -hmm. the uh, motorhome, big wheels, big tires. Uh, big engine, mm -hmm. saw one on the other day, and I'm thinking, you know, apples to apples, I really would want a tiny home. They have more character, they look like a home, they don't look like a big sausage going down the road. Mm -hmm. um, then you have towing campers. Um, I'm from Indiana originally, mm -hmm. so we are, I was in uh, Bristol, okay. Middlebury, so these are RV capitals of the world. Yeah. Jayco, Coachman, Scamper, mm. um, who else? <laughs> you know, you have a lot of these smaller campers that are made that you can tow behind the vehicle, yeah. pop it up, and be good. Um, so this isn't a quality high price, but yet um, still maybe a little bit on the low quality margin because they're yeah. manufactured quickly and inexpensively. Um, and Those then, were actually my first introduction to tiny house living, in a sense. You know, back in the 70s, my mom was very interested in looking at campers and RVs. And so I became enamored with the idea of you know, having all that stuff in a little space. And somehow they fit you know, microwave oven and a stove and a mm -hmm. refrigerator. And it was sort of like self-contained, sustainable at the time, it seemed. You could just drive down the road and you had electricity or gas or whatever you needed to run these appliances. And, right. um, but as you say, it, it has that initial sparkle and glamour of all these appliances and, and functions and features, but ultimately a lot of that stuff's made of cheap plastic and things break and right. it's not intended for intensive wear or use. Or regular use right. on a daily basis. And mm -hmm. on, on the tent tote campers, the bottom half is a shell, mm -hmm. and the tent canvas sits inside. Yeah. And then when you want it, you pop it out. Yeah, so very seasonal use. Very seasonal. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to live in a Minnesota weather yeah. with a canvas top. Uh -huh. and I drive a Jeep with a canvas top. I know how breezy and fresh <laughs> air <laughs> they are. <laughs> yeah. um, on the flip side, then, mm -hmm. we have low price and high quality in that upper left-hand margin. Mm -hmm. So now we're looking, um, Nano Homes is another manufacturing yeah. um, tiny version. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have, further up, we have Tiny Texas Homes mm -hmm. um, going up the center column of that quarter. And then on the flip side, then we have We Homes, which is out of Minnesota, but, um, a prefab mm -hmm. home can be assembled in their factory and then set on site. And that's up in that, they're, they're in a top higher bracket. Very, yeah. very, very top quality. Um, very fine crop quality product, mm -hmm. and then you have tumbleweed and tiny home products in, yeah. the, in that yeah. center corner, which we are really looking at because more people can buy their own trailers, make their own trailers, mm -hmm. and then use recycling materials or recycled, reclaimed wood right. to build their own their own module or, or tiny home. On We're wheels. seeing more of these restore centers popping up. You know that are run by Habitat for Humanity and, and organizations like that. Right. So you can go and get windows and doors and repurpose materials and Super. save a lot of money. So you can fall anywhere in that top right quadrant of really getting high quality residential or commercial grade materials, mm -hmm. keeping your cost sort of wherever you want it depending on the craftsmanship and, you know. Yeah, and your skill thing. set abilities. Right. Okay. Okay, so here in this slide we're showing a, a tiny home builders. Um, the model is a tiny re uh, retirement. Um, it is an example of the size, the quality. It looks like a very enchanting environment. Trees are behind you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's every person's dream. And that's part of the selling appeal I've noticed with these is that, you know, to make these homes just be so attractive and cozy looking, you know, the lighting and the setting, how these are presented in on the web or catalogs or whatever. Correct. Yeah. And it doesn't look like a trailer or right. a mobile home. Yeah, it doesn't look like anything you've seen before no. other than a, a normal residential house. It's just tiny. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the next slide shows the <coughs> interior layout where you have a high ceiling and store facility mm. and... Um, in the layout of, you know, 
utilities. Okay. And then the interior, oh, how they beautiful. have it decorated. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Again, the lighting is so nice and the natural wood. Uh, another one for mm -hmm. uh, tiny home builders, and, a yeah. little different. The other, the first one we saw was a, a side entry. This is an, mm -hmm. an end entry okay. at the trailer. The what you would probably say the back of the trailer is actually the front of the house. Yeah, and it, the, it's interesting. You don't see these materials and this attention to detail and the high sort of visual aesthetic of it. You don't see that in larger homes, and my guess is it would just be cost prohibitive to build a three thousand square foot home with materials of this quality and with this much attention to detail. Correct. You know, so this makes it accessible for somebody to have something that's very attractive, very high quality, but affordable because it's smaller. Right, basically. and I think Jay Schaefer um, brought mention to that, is that as we reduce our size, now we can put more money in to make it a higher quality, mm -hmm. uh, better, better use of uh, resources. Yeah, and that becomes a mentality of I'm going to have less in my life, but what I do have that will be of quality, you know. Correct. Maybe my only mode of transportation will be a bicycle, but it'll be a nice one, or I'll take care of it, or, you know, it, yes. that type of thing. And this is, I guess, the floor plan of the of house the, that Of the model that side. we saw from the uh, front entry versus uh -huh. the side entry. Yeah. So it shows a longer, a longer entry or a grand entrance mm -hmm. than the one on the side. Myself, personally, I tend to like the front entry. Mm. The side entry just seems like I'm maybe yeah. wasting space. I noticed some of these designs becoming available recently and thought that that would be popular because people want to have three or four friends over and it creates this great room, you know, entryway that can serve as, as an entryway but also as a sort of multi-purpose space where maybe a guest could stay over or people can visit. Um, so it is nice to have a little more room in there. Yes. Mm. And then the Weebly, Weeby from Tiny uh, tiny Homes on Wheels, the Tumbleweed, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I specifically like this one, the 102 mm -hmm. square foot, the entry on the left, a yeah. uh, small, sunny, great room mm -hmm. on the front side, and then this nice, large, open space, which for me, I've been reducing my life to live in a 9x12 to see how I would fit mm -hmm. and I have to say that I really like it. <laughs> I remember the first time I saw the Weeby it was when Jay was traveling through Iowa City on his way to an East Coast event uh, and it was a cross-country trip um, and he was doing these open houses and it was fascinating and he would stop and hundreds of people in some cases would come to see the home because they would hear about this but I, I really liked that you, you were talking about this larger space in the front with the entry on the left and all of those windows, it just creates such an open and bright area. I think there were room for a couple of chairs in this little nook and then maybe two or three more chairs inside. Right. Yeah. And then I, if I remember correctly from the documentary that I saw, these windows on the side came out so they could put more furniture in for the setup. Oh, interesting. And then yeah. the, the cupola on the top, or I call it a uh -huh. cupola, some of them have windows, so then you have mm. More iridescence coming in, that more ventilation, nice. yeah. um, light. And yeah. This is something that, about small houses that's sort of a paradox that you don't think about, but in a larger home, you don't have any rooms with north and south and east and west windows in the room. No. You, you, I mean, you'll have one window facing east or a window facing south, depending on what none, none or none, on none you know. <laughs> and the neat thing about tiny homes is that you can have a room or the house itself is a one-room house, like a one-room schoolhouse, but there, there can be windows in every direction. And there's light coming from every direction, and wherever the sun happens to be during the day, the light makes its way into the house. So you don't have that darkness and the need to turn on artificial light um, until it's you know, late at night, but right. you're probably going to sleep at that time. So right. it's, uh, it's kind of neat that way. And then not only light, but then actual natural circulation of... Yeah, the air, the that air. really helps. <laughs> I found in, in my house I could open the upstairs window and then have a little 12-volt um, computer fan in a downstairs window and just with everything else closed, because these homes are so, they have such a tight building envelope, they're so airtight, 
um, you can you don't want it run out of oxygen, so you always leave your window open. Uh, this is the Fensel. Uh, it's a 130 square foot and includes a porch and the loft, but it's um, a little different layout. Uh, this is also from Tumbleweed. Mm -hmm. I I got hooked on Jay's creations and uh, kind of favor those. Yeah. Um, but I have also seen other ones. So. <laughs> Here's the Pompo, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. It is a shipping container that's been recycled. Hmm. And one of the ideas when I, I was playing with um, uh, the products was wouldn't it be neat if you could take um, the shipping container and have one go this way and then have a second one on top hmm. making a V. <laughs> oh, and then you could have a a spiral a staircase yeah. that goes into the second half that sits over some pillars for support. Uh -huh. And I live in a lake region of 10,000 plus. And if you could have a, uh, a decking out so you can oversee the lake. Oh, that And then on nice. the flip side, because you're in a V, mm -hmm. maybe you have a uh, sun sundial or a fire pit ring mm -hmm. where you have a artistically laid out gravel pit oh yeah and you can sit on the north side mm. or the side that faces the pit have your um, your hot tub that's organically <laughs> <laughs> operated yeah and and then have the fire in the in the back side so of this V oh. you have you know everything you really need but you but different you know it's a taking the container idea and yeah. just adding a second story and being a little more I creative. like that idea of it not just being a container on top of a container but this angled out that V or L shape like you're talking about where it sort of takes a different artistic block shape form or something. You know? Yeah you weld the two yeah. together uh -huh. and maybe you have a carport off the side and then you come in on one end and that's mm -hmm. your mud room yeah, and then you uh, open the the wind um, one panel or two panels for a slide door, so you can generate mm -hmm. or have the the sun come in south facing, mm -hmm. warm up the metal, keep yep. the block warm, uh -huh. through the, you know seasonally. Yeah, and then as you come around the corner, maybe pop that out so it can hold your entertainment supply, mm -hmm. and then you're around the corner, <laughs> and then go up the stairs to your loft where you sleep or. Yeah. Whatever. And these shipping containers, how much are they to get one? You know, I've seen a lot of different prices, mm -hmm. and so it's a two thousand, um, maybe five thousand. Yeah, between there. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. And uh, you know, Duluth, we have a shipping yard, so huh. they're attainable. You just have to be able to transport them. Yeah. Interesting. So here's the uh, a slide that shows the inside um, square footage mm -hmm. uh, of the Pompo for Tumbleweed. Yeah. Okay. Features. We show that the features for a um, tiny home is made out of natural and reclaimed materials, mm -hmm. handcrafted, recycled. Um, they're a micro mansion versus a Mac mansion. Mm -hmm. uh, energy efficient because they're a smaller space, there's yep. less utility. They're, they can be uh, developed to be either on or off grid. Um, minimize consumption and we know portable. Mm -hmm. And portable is nice because regionally conditions can change, uh, economies can change. You know, these big factories come in and everything's wonderful, and thousands of people have jobs, and suddenly you know, everything's gone. Right. They've moved to some other country. So, um, you know, or if there's, and usually you know ahead of time, inclement weather coming, a hurricane is predicted, or there are wildfires that are kind of encroaching on your property or whatever, whatever these regional changing conditions are, you, if you have a movable home, your Take investment with goes with you. Yeah. It's an awesome plan, you know. Yeah. Um, benefits, co-friendly, eco-friendly, low impact, durable, uh, affordable housing, which is important, green living, easy transportation, and uh, tax benefits, mm -hmm. being small. Yeah, I remember I was trying to figure out how I was going to pay taxes on my home, and the people I talked with, you know, at the state just said, well, it's whatever the value of the trailer is what you're paying, your license plate, you know, you buy for your trailer, 
and then it's assessed on the value of the trailer. So my, I think my taxes were $50 a year, and they don't care what you put on that. If you put a boat on it or a house on it, they don't look at the value of what you put on the trailer, just the trailer. And then the land that it sits on, somebody's already paying taxes for that land. So mm -hmm. you know, it's not that you're evading taxes because the taxes are getting paid. In fact, in this case, the taxes on the land are already being paid, plus the taxes on the trailer are being paid, so they're, they're getting more taxes than they would otherwise. But um, it, it is inexpensive, you know, $50 a year versus, I know some people that are homeowners, it can be uh, $300, $500 a month, you know. I think uh, at the average is around 5000 in the area that I wow. live in, in Minnesota. Um, I like portable alternative dwellings mm. from Oregon, and yeah. this slide shows one of their pictures from their website that I borrowed, and um, I've made contact with them. But <laughs> I'd like to get out there and take a workshop, learn more. Mm -hmm. I've definitely enjoyed um, seeing their progress. Yeah. It yeah, looks a lot of fun. You know, that's another element actually to this is that it's partly about the homes and independence and the fun of the creativity of it all, but the people that are behind these. This movement? This movement, yeah, you know, that are just really interesting, inspiring, creative, fun, funny, you know, out of the box people. And it's, uh, there's that whole element to it, you know. Sure. That I think is interesting. And, and they're not, I mean, this is not an isolated event. Mm -hmm. You know, they're popping up. I found another one out in Massachusetts huh. um, yesterday. And I, after all the information you sent me, I opened up and saw all the blogs and, the huh. <laughs> <laughs> and did some search on my end. And yeah. I was like, OK, where was this information <laughs> when I wrote this product? But so in this slide, we're showing how tiny living encompasses yeah. um, we tiny houses versus larger homes. and. And, and then we have life simplification. Mm -hmm. Definitely with smaller space, you live more simply. Um, in my study or my research, I found a, a lady who is a professor at one of the colleges in Texas, and she went from a four-bedroom home, downsized or edited her life, and chose the priorities of her life, put that in the house that she next got, and it was mm -hmm. a 700 square foot. Wow. And she left behind the side by side and the and the uh, side by side refrigerator mm -hmm. and the laundry unit and took her grandmother's antiques, put them in the mm -hmm. in storage and kept her books, which I understand how that is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so downsizing or editing your your lifestyle, mm -hmm. making changes today, so you're using less consumption. So that simplifies your life. We've got inter inter environment uh, consciousness, mm -hmm. being aware. <laughs> we hear aware a lot of times. Self-sufficiency, sound financial plans, and mm -hmm. social consciousness. Yeah. Okay, so the Livable Communities Act is, uh, is an act that's found in Minnesota. I'm sure if you research your state, you'll notice that your state might have a same or similar act. Um, 94 participating cities within the metro, uh, the seven county metro that we talked about earlier, has a, li a liable communities act grant. And uh, this is a grant that cities can apply for, um, for growth and development. And the state give them, awards them with some funds so they mm. can build and make affordable housing available. Wow, that's great. So tiny homes could offer to the city a benefit mm -hmm. for that. Okay, so this is a proposed development. I did some research, found some land, uh, estimated property tax, annual interest, development costs, building costs, permit costs, marketing, to come to a nice total of about $5 million. Mm. And the land uh, is located on the west side of Minnesota, uh, or I should say Mound, Minnesota. Mound is known for its uh, former site for the Tonka, Tonka Toys. Mm -hmm. And uh, this land is over in, this, in that direction, which is on the west side of the metro. Um, this is a primitive drawing. I'm not a developer. I'm not good with uh, archi our architecture. 
I used word paint or paint from Microsoft Office to draw a diagram of a potential. And uh, this is the land that's in question, that's in mound, and um, at, it could be a mixed use. Um, mm -hmm. The city's plot is uh, zoned for commercial, so that would kind of fit with the RV park. Yeah. Um, and then with the outside of the ring would be permanent housing mm -hmm. with access to the lake, Dutch Lake, which is part of the Minnetonka Lake system. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> mixed use more on the front left side, mm -hmm. on the top, the north side. And that would be like overnight parking, camping. Mm -hmm. um, if maybe you're traveling through the community with your tiny home on wheels, mm -hmm. you would now be able to park mm -hmm. and have an environment of a community uh, to enjoy your tiny home in. Yeah. Um, the center section, I decided a, a mixed use condition in there mm -hmm. um, to maybe make available home-based business. Mm -hmm. um, myself coming from a home-based business background, yeah. uh, we, we don't have a lot of, of uh, incubation um, places in the city of Mound for mm -hmm. maybe a startup beginning company. Yeah, um, we do have like 400 available, 400 home based businesses in the community mm -hmm. of 4.2 miles. Um, so this would offer an opportunity if someone is an artiste who needs a studio space, lives in the space, mm -hmm. can sell their wares. Um, the houses are abutted, so the back ends mm -hmm. you know, are, you know, close to each other. Yeah. So the outside of the house would be then a social, you know, able to to be accessed, mm -hmm. and then you'd have just a, um, a community there of businesses yeah. to service the the greater community and expand the city for commerce mm -hmm. and growth. And it makes this land and this community financially. Uh, not just financially sustainable, maybe, but financially abundant. That there would be a, a surplus of, you know, economy here because people are bringing money into the small community to right. pay for services or buy products. Right. So yeah. the people who live there, the people who camp there, they could come in and maybe they, you know, maybe it's um, homemade bread mm -hmm. or a bakery. We don't have that, that mound. Great. We don't have a bakery. Come to mound. Oh. Set up a bakery. Like these little storefronts, you know, with the, yeah. the overhang, and you step in and smell all the wonderful things. Yeah, chocolates. And then, oh, chocolates. <laughs> yes. Um, Sign me up. I want to go. Maybe you um, are a seamstress or mm. uh, make leather things. Yeah. Things out of leather. That is cool. <laughs> Um, and probably candles, there would be like you know, a general store or something yes. for people. Yeah. And we have we have a shopping center, we have a grocery store in Mound, we have several bars for mm -hmm. entertainment. Um, we have oh dozens and ponds, dozens of parks. Mm -hmm. um, I think the city of Mound has like 44 public parks and recreation, wow. so there's lots to do. What's the population? 10,000. 44 parks for 10,000 people. That's we have a lot of good. open space. That's nice. All right. <laughs> yes. Huh. And we have a developed business section, but this would be yeah. secondary to the downtown. Yeah. Could almost become an attraction. Yes. You know, a I mean, something like this, it would be a destination, and a people destination. might want to just come and, you know, you could have an opportunity where people could just come and stay overnight in a tiny house. Correct. Like a tiny house bed and breakfast or something. Yeah. Right, and we have limited lo lodging in this community. Mm -hmm. um, the nearest hotel would be in Long Lake. Mm -hmm. um, there might be a and b in Excelsior, mm -hmm. which is to the east of us. Yeah. But you have the greater Lake Minnetonka. Yeah. Uh, so you can bring your boat. And yeah, because Minnesota is already... I, th I think it's kind of a Midwest magnet for tourism. You know, you get um, the lakes and the wilderness and friendly people, and you know, it seems like there's a more active tourism board or effort, you know, in sure. Minnesota because they realize that. And right. Iowa has a lot to offer, but 
I don't know. People aren't coming here to see the cornfields necessarily, you know. Correct. Uh, it's kind of flat and ex non-exciting. Yeah, and so you know, there are there are definitely hubs of um, entertainment and industry. You know, Des Moines, Cedar Rapids, and other you know smaller communities have a lot to offer. But it's, in terms of like the beauty of nature, I think there is a lot of folks I know that go to Minnesota. They have a lake house there, or whatever, and so this would fit in with that, and it would be an additional draw. In addition to the housing um, in this slide, maybe somebody who likes to do festival festival oh, following. Right. We have a Spirit of Lakes Festival that happens every July for a weekend. Mm. And we have parades and foods and yeah. uh, we have a business showcase, we have an art showcase. Um, then our sister city, Admina Trista, also has Trista Days. Mm. So maybe you're a, a festival chaser uh -huh. and you can come bring in your your um, tiny home park yeah do the festival park in our facility and you know um, glean um, <laughs> glean from the community if, I, if that is necessary for you with my tiny house I, w I was surprised to have people coming from all over the country to see it you know and this would be a place where you know, people who are interested that want to see tiny homes, and particularly a tiny home community, I'm sure you get people from surrounding states and maybe elsewhere in the country, you know, coming to see this and see how it works. It would be a good model for others to, uh, you know, work from, possibly. So. Sure. Um, this village is actually um, coined Anthony's Village. Uh, Anthony's Floral is, it's, is, was situated there. They. Hmm. Um, fell short with the uh, economy so and they're in their upper 80s so they're in the retirement years mm. um, so the land is kind of devoted to them they've been a community supporter for all these all the years that they've been there since 1965 wow. so this is kind of a, a, a retribute to their yeah. effect um, so Anthony's village would have 32 mixed per use permits that are the home-based business 24 overnight parking and camping, and 32 leased or owned properties. Great. So we have, what, 80, 88? Yeah, a good diverse mix of... Yeah, yeah. opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, this shows um, the location of Anthony's um, village, where it's at Mount. Mount is not very big. We're about 4.4 square miles. Uh, 2.2 2 uh, 2 .2 of it is in water. Uh, <laughs> I can see that. It's, <laughs> it's kind of a sprawl. Huh. Um, we are close to the city by 30 minutes to Minneapolis. Wow. So, you know, when you jump on the highway here and there. Yeah. I mean, there are people that take an hour just to drive across. Yeah. Chicago or LA, so 30 <laughs> minutes is like a suburb. That's neat. And we're on the um, Metro Transit Monday oh. through Friday. And now on the weekend, we have um, a supplement transportation line called WeCab. Mm. Uh, they're working on their 501c right now. That's great. And uh, what they do is there's a list of volunteer drivers that sign up mm -hmm. and then are able to transport individuals, whether they're impaired or otherwise don't drive. Yeah. Um, allowing them to be more mobile and capable independency in the city and they can go to shopping doctor's appointments mm. um, or out to the metro transit area where they can be picked up to take into the city that's great um, this is a revenue based on um, the potential at the anthony's village okay. uh, with the 32 home-based businesses five rented spaces um, maybe this is a space where somebody is a festival goer mm -hmm. and they come periodically, so they rent the space. Um, tent owned, maybe you're a business owner and you want to buy that space and you live in a portion of the home and, and do your business in the, in the remaining part of the home. So yeah. then you buy that space, you're considered a home based. Um, and then you have 15. Um, 15 land and tiny home packages. Hmm. So this is a concept that when you uh, want to live in this community, you can bring your own trailer. You can buy the land and trailer together, hmm. which is, I think, a good concept. That's what you do with your traditional home. Mm -hmm. um, uh, or you can just buy the land and bring your trailer whenever you want to visit. Interesting.
Okay. So you're not like screwed down to something, mm -hmm. so to speak. So you're, you know, I kind of broke it down as to if you did the land lease package, you'd get a land purchase, mm -hmm. portable tiny home, equipped with a garden. You can choose to live on or off grid, and then uh, total revenue and annual earnings. That is neat. So a person could buy a tiny home and land and just come and move in, basically, right? right. That's Nice. The other thought I had about is uh, throwing in a buyback pro um, program. Mm -hmm. Say you bought the, proc uh, the package, the home and the and the land together, mm -hmm. and you know as economy changes and your job changes and you take your tiny home, then we buy back your land and resell it. Oh, nice! As a you know to the next person as a package again. Yeah. So you're not out. That's good. Yeah, because that's a concern some people have. Although. Realistically, the small house market is so rich right now, they're in really in demand. Um, people wanting to reduce their risk and lower their costs, that yeah, it should be fairly easy to find new buyers. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this, sh this slide shows Jay Schaefer's um, tiny village that he has planned for 2015 in South Southern California. Um, I like his concept. I kind of threw it in there to show uh, a better development idea uh, against my primitive drawing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, he must have some cool software to drop those trees and things in there. You know? <laughs> yeah. uh, for me, I think that that's a little more parking space than I wanted to have. Mm -hmm. But his concept, you know, um, is more open to. And uh, in, in comparison to mine, I have uh, a little more larger space per home yeah. than his layout. So that's the only difference. I just put it in as a comparison that other people, not just myself, not just Mound, uh, looking at this idea of growing a, a tiny home village. Yeah. Well, I have seen um, plans similar to this one of, of Jay's where the parking is off to one side and the community itself, it consists of trails that you can walk or bike or maybe use uh, you know, wheelchair or whatever mobility, but it takes up a lot less room then in the developed area um, because you don't need streets. Sure. So you just need a parking spot. Yeah. Um, so that's one advantage. And then possibly, you know, if this larger facility, I don't know what that is, but like a community center, um, again, revenue generating, if you were to rent that out to people who needed something for weddings or conferences, events, you know, right. um, that could be done. And then the parking maybe could be used um, for that. For overflow. Yeah. And, and the more people you have, if it's a mixed-use space, you wouldn't need as many cars, though, because the person's you know, waking up in the morning and they're going over to their bread shop or whatever right. they're thinking. So they don't need to drive anywhere because their house and their work are, you know. Together. Yeah, 50 feet away or something. <laughs> So, um, and this is a picture of, of um, tiny homes, uh, village of Jay Shaker's idealism. So. All right. And this is what sparked my investigation in the beginning. Mm. Um, was the documentary from FairCompanies.com. Was that D. Williams? Uh, no. Because they had another video with with D in it, but I'll have to check this out. Maybe I'll bring it up in the video. Yes, this one is, I'm not sure where Fair Companies is from. She had a slight accent, so it could be from Europe okay. or New York. Yeah. Because she did, uh, she covered everything. And that um, may be why she picked up this other video, and it could have just been a re, you know, broadcast of a YouTube video, but I had seen the one about Dee Williams. But I'll, I'll check this out. So it was a short video about the Small House Movement? Um, it, it covered everything from where the concept in Japan started, mm. micro apartments, yep. um, apartment in a box, uh -huh. were some of the things that she showed, um, where this apartment complex, no larger than this room here, would have a box when you open, slide things out, and you, now you have a kitchen, uh -huh. and at one end you have a bed. And yeah. <laughs> And it was um, using space very efficiently, which is what really caught my key. Yeah, living spaces that can be morphed into other uses. Correct. As needed. Yeah. 
And this slide just shows a different a variety of different homes. We have the pallet home, uh, can, uh, container home, we have a boat, houseboat. We have those on Lake Minnetonka too. And you just probably, it'd be very hard to do it year round unless you were putting a dry dock or had a bubbler around. So um, this is interesting. It's out in the desert, it's on glass. You can really do that in Minnesota just because of our climate. Mm. Um, but I liked it anyway. And a lot of these are southern driven, maybe because I'm looking for summer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I understand that Tiny Green Homes out of White Bear Lake makes uh, portable homes uh, conditional to our climate here in the Midwest. So yeah. they're heavily insulated. They're green materials, so it's not going to allow you to have too many allergies or be allergy sensitive to chemicals. Mm -hmm. Uh, certain wood interiors so they won't raise, you know, pine smell. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of people like smell of pine. So, um, more houses. We have the um, house box, the German architect, mm -hmm. can't keep, think of his name right now, um, but the house box, I thought that would be really cool out on um, some, some area of the property in Anthony's Village and mm -hmm. having having the top portion of the, uh, of the box be all glass with a decking system around so you can see that 4.4 square miles of mound. That would be cool. <laughs> and maybe oh, make it like a, a goal <laughs> system. You have one on either side with a, yeah. uh, a walkway in the middle. That is neat. And then have uh, observation deck. It would be your version of like Hancock Tower or whatever these places in Chicago or New York City right. where you you can charge if you need. Yeah, you can put your quarter in yes, and exactly. see what you need to see. That's cool. Uh, this is documentary of all the things I've searched. Wow. Um, city council meetings, mm. city plannings, um, city codes and regulations, state regulations. And it's interesting Lots. because a lot of those regulations are the same from one municipality to the, the other because you know, who's going to go out and hire a team of uh, uh, 20 lawyers or whatever to develop municipal laws and bylaws and you know zoning codes and all that if you can just grab sort of a generic packet of similar rules from the next community over right and so everyone's sort of copying everyone else's idea yeah, yeah. Code. so in slide is you know special things Google mm -hmm. you know, Careful for their Wi-Fi, so I could do all this research. Oh, and then, cool. uh, you know, the city officials, city manager, uh, Candace Hansen, city planner, Sarah Smith, um, and the and the family, the um, Eva and Anthony Vandersteek, which mm. owns the property or owned the property yeah. for their floral business, and then um, and windows paint. My primitive <laughs> drawing. <laughs> well, this is just a wonderful presentation. I think people are going to enjoy it, and uh, I'm glad we could go through it. As soon as I got to like the first few slides, and I was like, we have to just do this to walk through the sure. presentation. So, is there anything else you'd want to share on the video or people? Now, I should also put in maybe a plug for you. You may be able to travel if people wanted you to come speak or. Just do consulting with them, or maybe you could do over the phone consulting, but you'd be available to do that. I know people, you may not have thought of this, and a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, who's going to be interested in what I have to say? But actually, you know, when you find out that the, all the research and time you've put into this, and the more time you spend on it, um, you, you become really kind of a resource and uh, someone that people would like to get help from. So are you open to that? I'm open to that. Okay. I'm presently I'm a freelance project manager. Mm -hmm. um, in, in my prior years as a massage therapist, mm -hmm. one of the marketing features that I truly enjoy is to going to the city council meetings. And in that five minute, uh, nothing on the agenda, you can speak whatever you want to speak for at least three minutes. Oh. It's a great advertising opportunity. That's a good idea. And uh, <laughs> I, I give that to the free world. Yes. Okay, check out your city council. It's a great advocate place. You get on your local TV. You often. get on your local TV, the city council, the city manager, and all the staff become your advocate. Super good. <laughs> well, that tip is is worth it. I'm going to put up then some links at the end of the video so people can get to your Facebook page or whatever. Sounds um, good. Yeah. So yeah. thank you very much. Thank you for the interview. I appreciate right. it.